I think people should stop eating wild salmon. Okay. Oh, for God's sake, <laughs> stop fishing. There are five dominant salmon species in British Columbia that will be addressed in this short documentary. Chinook, coho, pink, chum, and sockeye. Salmon spawn in distinct rivers or even sections of rivers and become isolated from other subpopulations of salmon. A species of salmon is all the salmon that can breed with each other, while the stock is the local population of the salmon species, in which most breeding tends to occur due to reproductive isolation as a result of anadromy and homing. What all these stocks and species have in common are their life cycles and spawning habits. Salmon are anadromous, meaning they begin their lives in fresh water, migrating to the ocean until they reach maturity when they return back to, more often than not, the same fresh water system they hatched out of to spawn. During their marine years, they are widely distributed throughout the Pacific Ocean and Bering Sea for as long as one to seven years. Very few stocks remain in coastal or fresh waters. Upon reaching maturity, they find their way back to the rivers from which they hatched using special homing techniques that recognize the Earth's magnetic fields and water profiles from their journey as young. Upon returning to the freshwater system, they spawn in gravel beds in rivers, streams, or along lake shores. Spawning occurs between late summer and early winter and comes at a huge energetic cost to the fish. Once they have laid their eggs, they die. We came in contact with three individuals who together have a diverse knowledge on the role of salmon in British Columbia. One of them is Kylie, a marine ecologist and professor at the University of Victoria. Another is Hugh, a senior oceanographic technician with Fisheries and Oceans Canada. And the third is Ray, a longtime salmon fisherman off the coast of Vancouver Island. When asked what the impacts of wild salmon are in British Columbia, the following two are among some of the responses generated. Most, mostly to do with uh, traditions, like, you know, Alberta has beef, BC has salmon or seafood. So, I mean, I don't know how to, how to put that. I mean, socially, basically, we've, you know, always depended on salmon back here. Economically, we've always depended on salmon and environment. Well, that's hard to say what happens there, except for you know, when bears grab them and drag them into the bush, and that's how big trees grow, right? Personally, I think more about the ecological impacts because that's my area of study, but uh, it's very well documented that salmon have a, a massive impact both on the marine and on the terrestrial ecosystems uh, in terms of a food source and um, specifically terrestrial air food source for a lot of bears and, and uh, wolves and then a lot of other... Um, meso predators or scavengers that, that eat the carcasses as well, um, and just you know their sheer biomass means they have to have uh, an impact on the marine ecosystem for sure. Uh, Wild salmon in British Columbia play a huge role in the marine terrestrial interface as a spatial subsidy. Up to 99% of nutrients in salmon are marine derived, amassed during the one to two years they spend in the ocean. Terrestrial systems are largely lacking in nitrogen, which is abundant in marine ecosystems. Salmon carry these marine nutrients as they travel upstream to spawn and are intercepted by bears and wolves, who carry especially large salmon into the forest to avoid competition with other predators. The carcasses are left disposed on the forest floor and result in conifers growing at three times the regular speed in the presence of salmon-derived nutrients. During the salmon run, a bear will on average consume 13 salmon per day for 45 days. Bears will get 33 to 94% of their nutrients from salmon, depending on the size of the run. During the same run, grey wolves will catch on average 21 salmon per hour, each with a success rate of 39%. Pacific salmon abundance along the west coast of Canada peaked in the mid-1980s at record high levels. Around 1990 began a sharp and continuous decline in salmon stock that reached a historic low for the past century in 1998. The species that noticed the most drastic change in population size were coho and chinook salmon. To remedy this decline, hatcheries have begun releasing 5 billion juvenile salmon as part of a stock enhancement program. The counts of wild salmon are so low that these human-raised salmon contribute up to 80% of juvenile salmon in coastal waters as is the case with coho salmon in British Columbia. Depicted here are the release of juvenile salmon. 
Notice how coho are released in the smallest portion, but this release is the largest contributor in percentage of juvenile fish in any particular salmon species on the coast of British Columbia. Despite these efforts, overall survival for hatchery Chinook and coho salmon continued to decline, particularly marine survival. A comparison of survival for hatchery versus for wild salmon is difficult to compose primarily due to the lack of data for wild stocks. In their book, Making Salmon, released in 1999, scientist Taylor stated that it is generally accepted that survival in the early freshwater stages is substantially better for hatchery-reared salmon, meaning even fewer wild salmon survive in the marine system than do the hatchery salmon, whose survival rate is depicted above and is not very high. Next, our interviewees were asked what the biggest threat to salmon health at any point in their lives were. Personally, I think it's overharvesting. Okay. Absolutely. Without a doubt, overharvesting is the biggest threat to, to our salmon populations. Um, probably closely followed by climate change, but we're not, we're not sure how that's going to affect them yet. Okay. Yeah, the biggest threat to BC wild salmon and health in any stage of their life is habitat. And that's uh, both um, in the rivers and offshore, like ocean survival is one of the biggest things. One of the biggest threats to salmon health are the effects of global warming on water temperature and the ocean current, which disrupts the entire food chain from microorganisms to larger ocean beasts. This also means drier summers, which puts strains on salmon entering freshwater systems to spawn. Heavy rain in combination with logging in these watersheds create historic flooding events which wipe out natural shorelines and riverbanks, as well as trees which stabilize the sediment and help shade keeping the water temperature cool. Decreased survival rate of juvenile salmon and a correlated decrease in spawners is caused by increased deforestation. Deforestation accelerates snowmelt, which increases river speed and carries juvenile salmon into marine systems before they are equipped to survive in them. Logging in freshwater systems is particularly destructive to coho salmon as they spawn in smaller tributaries which are more prone to damage, which explains why coho salmon are in such low abundance in British Columbia when they used to dominate coastal streams prior to 1920. It turns out, I don't know if you knew this, but uh, salmon, when they go back to their natal streams, they go back to the exact same place where they were born. Yeah. Like the same pool and everything. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out now that they're finding out that when small baby salmon or smolts, when they're heading out to sea, they go back to the exact same spot where their adult, where their parents fed. All right. So, yeah, so this is kind of interesting. So basically, if you have like a big upwelling and there's all sorts of, you know, plankton and stuff like that, then you have a high survival rate because mm -hmm. there's lots of food. But if you have different currents and different weather conditions and suddenly those salmon go back to the same place and there is no plankton and no food, then they're not going to survive. Sea surface temperature change in the winter will have a larger negative effect on survival rate on the stock than summer sea surface temperature increase. Therefore, the season of stock entry into the marine system plays a crucial role in the survival rate of the stock as our climate continues to change. Climate changes are also likely to modify the Pacific ecosystems by affecting average wind speeds, upwelling, and ocean circulation which will have an effect on food availability for all species of BC salmon and other marine life as well. Due to the significance of these variables brought up by our interviewees, we asked how effective they believe Fisheries Canada is at managing the wild salmon stock in British Columbia. Um, I, I think we have a long way to go. Okay. I think that we, uh, I think the federal government has a long way to go before we are effectively managing our salmon stocks. I think that we're using antiquated methods in terms of the minimal, uh, maximum sustainable yield mm -hmm. and, and not considering enough the other components to the ecosystem. Five, how effective is Fisheries Canada at managing BC stocks? Absolutely zero. <laughs> how, can you manage, how can you manage something you can't see? Fisheries and Oceans Canada has done little in the past 30 years to help the fishers of the West Coast. They are not listening to the people who have hands-on experience with our salmon, leaving people in charge of our West Coast waters that work out of an office thousands of miles away. The following is some insight given by Hugh, the oceanographic technician with Fisheries Canada, on how salmon stock can be better managed. When I was quite young, they had a ban on herring fishing for five years. It was an absolute moratorium, no herring fishing. 
Really? And then when they brought it, yeah, they brought it back, and of course everybody's now making millions of dollars on the herring on yeah. the row. But um, the reason that they could do that is because they came back in absolute gangbusters. So they had a complete shutdown of wild salmon fishing on any type, commercial and um, you know sports fishery. Mm-hmm. Then they'd probably do quite well. They'd make quite a quite a good comeback. If Fisheries Canada were to ban all salmon fishing, where would people turn to for nutrients? There's other marine fish that are, are managed a lot more sustainably right now. So halibut are managed cross cross border. So Canada and the U.S. have worked together for the International Halibut Commission right. uh, to, to hopefully better uh, manage that that harvest and just simply eating lower on the trophic chain. You know, salmon are quite high trophically, and so just moving lower, you're getting some of those similar nutrients that you would be getting from from salmon, but without having uh, such an ecological uh, footprint. An alternative option to Kylie's is eating aquaculture salmon, so salmon lovers do not have to give up their dietary inclinations. Here's what our interviewees thought about that option. I don't have a problem with salmon farming if it could be West Coast Chinook salmon that is farmed. Atlantic salmon should not be introduced into the Pacific in any way. Net breakouts such as the one from Washington State this past summer of 2017 could be catastrophic to our wild stocks. I think it came too fast. It came too quickly and there wasn't enough regulation and there wasn't enough effective monitoring to make sure that it's a truly sustainable method of, of growing fish. And certainly not harvesting Atlantic salmon. I think that's very inappropriate. I mean, my biggest thing, I think they should have fish farms on land. Mm-hmm. Like, they should have them in big tanks. They shouldn't have them in the wild. Because what happens is that the salmon, when they're coming in, they have um, lice on them, and then they're, they're not harmed because they're adult salmon. But as soon as they go up the rivers, that's what the lice die off. Mm-hmm. Right? But if the salmon that are in the pens, they don't die off. Yeah. Right? because they're not in the river, so then they get the lice. But what happens is when the salmon spawn and the, the fry come out of the river, they're immediately into sea lice territory because all the farm fish have a sea lice mouth. Mm. Sea lice is an ectoparasite, meaning it lives outside the organism. They latch onto juvenile salmon as they swim through freshwater systems past fish farms on their way to the open ocean. The density of sea lice on juvenile salmon was measured across a sample area that ensured salmon could only move unidirectionally and were exposed to multiple aquaculture farms. Sea lice were collected at no exposure to salmon farms, some exposure and abundant exposure, and it was concluded that around salmon farms, lice is in 33,000 times greater abundance, infection is 73 times higher and the lice footprints span a distance of over 30 kilometers in water around the farm. On a study done on pink salmon in BC, three sea lice on a juvenile pink salmon is enough to kill the fish. The consequences of declining impossible stock collapse are not unique to those whose lives are closely associated with salmon, as are our interviewees. Stock collapse has consequences for all. But I think, I, I mean, everything is connected at the end of the day. And I think when one thing goes, it's going to impact everything else. And, and so it'll indirectly affect some of the things that I study and some of the things that I value. So. But when, what are the bears going to do? Yeah. And what, you know, and all the birds and then all, you know, everything up there. And the same, even just the bears that drag the, the salmon into the woods. Because, you know, a black bear is not going to stay, stay by the river and eat its salmon. It drags it into the bush and that's how they get big trees and salmon and, uh, and stream bottoms, right? Mm-hmm. So the consequences of declining BC stocks are everything from whales, bears, uh, income from people. You know, there are still fishermen out there, believe it or not. Mm-hmm. And um, it just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's an iconic symbol of BC. So if you have BC salmon going, then, then what? So what does all of this mean for the people whose lives don't revolve around salmon? We asked two of our roommates the same questions and hear how their answers vary. Not to make you guys look stupid. It's to make you guys look stupid. <laughs> no, it's actually... It's We're going to be put juxtaposed against these, like, intelligent scientists. <laughs> no, so the first question is, what impacts do wild salmon have in BC? These can be social, economic, environmental, or other impacts. Whichever you want to... <laughs> you want to talk first? Well, I mean... 
salmon are a big thing in BC, uh, and so naturally, you know, since BC is on the coast, uh, it, it's a big part of the economy. Yes. Uh, but, uh, you know, I don't know much more. <laughs> so, have you heard of any threats to BC wild salmon? What do you believe are the biggest, um, just to their health at any stage in their lives? I've heard things, it's just, I don't really recall. I hear a lot about, like, oil and stuff, and I don't know if that's even related to salmon. I know salmon go to the ocean for most of their lives, so probably, and I know that there was this whole thing about the oil tankers coming through the BC coast and stuff, so, yeah, there's that. Okay, um, have you heard anything about aquaculture? At all. No, <laughs> not at all. <laughs> have okay. Um, how effective do you believe Fisheries Canada is at managing the BC salmon stocks? I don't know because I don't fish. <laughs> I'm sorry. I never really tried to find out anything about that. So, I mean, since they're in decline, probably not that. Not as good as it's uh, <laughs> supposed to be, but... Alright, so if the stock collapsed, how would this affect you, and how do you think it would affect British Columbia? Personally, it wouldn't affect me really at all, since I don't eat salmon, I don't really eat fish in general, uh, but BC would make less jobs uh, it would, it would, I don't know. You can only think of economic reasons how it can. I don't know how it would impact us. me. I'm sure it would indirectly somehow. I also don't eat a lot of fish, but I'm sure there's more to it than that. And kind of like a, a chain of one thing leading to another, which would come back to me somehow. I don't know how that would be 